Good morning, good afternoon and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining the Climate Disclosure Standards Board and our friends today to discuss the state of, state of environmental disclosure in Europe in 2020. Since the signing of the Paris Agreement nearly five years ago to the day, we've seen a global shift in the way companies are talking about climate and environmental related risks and opportunities. And although COVID-19 might have delayed some important milestones such as COP26, to continue furthering the climate and wider sustainability agendas. Changes are still on the way and we can hope that 2021 will be the year when we see a seismic shift and renewed action on sustainable finance and corporate reporting agendas, both in Europe and globally. Recent months have been very busy with some major announcements from a number of governments around the globe, moving towards mandatory TCFD requirements Global standard setters and reporting initiatives have announced in September their intention to collaborate further in order to achieve a comprehensive corporate reporting system and got the support of IOSCO to play such a role. And the IFRS Foundation has launched an important consultation on sustainability reporting. And of course, the EU has a lot of major initiatives along the way that our first speaker, European Commissioner Marie McGuinness, will summarise for us. Collaboration and harmonisation are core to CDSB's DNA. We've been engaging with EU and member states, regulators and supervisors for many years and, were, and as well the international key players in that field. The EU has been a clear leader in these discussions since the publication of the Action Plan on Sustainable Growth back in 2018, which gave rise to the taxonomy on regulation, sorry, the taxonomy regulation. At CDSB, we see corporate reporting and the review of the non-financial reporting directive as the new taxonomy of the upcoming renewed sustainable finance strategy. We will keep engaging with all the interested parties in years to come to boost the quality of corporate disclosures and foster innovation in the EU and at a global level. One way to make a valid contribution to these debates is the research we undertake. Reading corporate reports pretty much cover to cover. An example of that work will be presented to you today, and we hope you'll find the, find the our results useful. But first, we are very happy to welcome with us today Commissioner Mairead McGuinness, in charge of Financial Services, Financial Stability and the Capital Markets Union, about the upcoming initiatives the EU is planning on sustainable finance, corporate reporting, and more broadly across the Capital Markets Union. Thank you. Well, a very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honoured to be invited by the Sustainability Disclosure Standards Board to speak to you today. It's my great pleasure to open this event. It's clear that we face some daunting challenges as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. I'll talk to you today about sustainable finance, corporate reporting and the Capital Markets Union. These are vital topics in our recovery, but also for building the Europe that we want to see. These policies will be key priorities during my mandate. Two major developments have dramatically changed the finance landscape over the last year. First, of course, is the European Green Deal, which is a top priority for the Commission. The Union, as you know, is determined to achieve climate neutrality by 2050 and to increase the 2030 emission reduction targets and to implement a set of major reforms on broader environmental objectives. Second, of course, the COVID-19 crisis. This has destabilised our economies and our societies, not to mention the impact on our healthcare systems. Now, some have reacted by labelling sustainability as a luxury that's only possible when times are good. They say we should postpone action on sustainable finance until this crisis has passed and they see only a status quo recovery. Now, I want to be very clear, the COVID-19 crisis cannot be used as an excuse to delay addressing the challenges of climate change, environmental degradation and biodiversity loss. In fact, we should look at the European Green Deal as a green and sustainable growth strategy that can strongly contribute to our recovery. Delivering on this Green Deal requires mobilising at least half a trillion euros per year of additional investments in the European Union. And these investments will be a source of new economic and employment opportunities and will help us to recover from the crisis. The next generation EU recovery package presented by the Commission in May will mobilise 750 billion euros to help our member states. President Ursula von der Leyen announced that 37% of next generation EU will be spent directly on our European Green Deal objectives. 
And we will take green financing to the next level. The President has set a target of 30% of next generation EU to be raised through green bonds. The financial system will need to provide the financial resources to make the climate transition happen. But this transition is not yet happening fast enough. The rules of the game must be transformed to fully integrate sustainability at every step of the financial value chain. And that's why the Commission is preparing a renewed sustainable finance strategy for early next year. One of the priorities of this renewed strategy will be to strengthen the foundations for sustainable investment. And the review of the non-financial reporting directive is crucial. Sustainability is becoming a critical factor in business success. This means sustainability reporting is ever more important. Some European companies, including many that are participating in this event, are world leaders in sustainability reporting and sustainability performance. But overall, sustainability reporting falls far short of what we need to meet the ambitions of the European Green Deal and our sustainable finance agenda. The report published by the Climate Disclosure Standard Board provides detailed evidence of the shortcomings of current reporting practices. The report covers 50 of Europe's largest companies, so the full situation could be worse still. According to a public consultation that we ran earlier this year, 70% of users of company reports believe that companies fail to disclose relevant information. Some 74% have concerns about how reliable the information is, and 84% find that reported information is not comparable between companies. A broad coalition of stakeholders support change, from trade unions, environmental organisations, central banks, institutional investors and progressive companies. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the vulnerability of business to non-financial threats. It has also exposed the social vulnerability of many workers and citizens throughout the company value chains. From both perspectives, the result is greater demand for more and better information from companies. The Commission will put forward a proposal to revise the non-financial reporting directive in March next year, alongside the renewed sustainable finance strategy. Our ultimate aim is to put financial and so-called non-financial information on the same footing. Common financial reporting rules across Europe have been important in developing the Capital Markets Union thus far. Common sustainability reporting rules will be an important step in completing it. In revising the non-financial reporting directive, we need to look at many issues, including audit, digitalisation and what sorts of companies should be subject to reporting requirements. To help address the digital challenge, the Commission's new action plan for the Capital Markets Union actions includes the creation of a European single access point. The aim is to facilitate digital access to the financial and non-financial information that European companies report. Our proposal to revise the non-financial reporting directive will of course also need to look at the content. So what exactly should companies report? Increasingly, we believe that this question can only be answered by a requirement on companies to use common reporting standards. And that's why we've asked the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group to explore the development of European non-financial reporting standards. And we look forward to their recommendations at the end of January next. The European Union already has an ambitious legal framework on sustainable finance, including the taxonomy regulation and the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation. The Commission intends to put forward a proposal for new legislation on sustainable corporate governance and due diligence. This creates a set of expectations for company reporting that are specific to Europe. And it leads us to believe that there needs to be a more European solution to the standards question. At the same time, we need to make progress towards greater global alignment of sustainability reporting requirements. We will support initiatives that contribute to that goal, while keeping our flexibility to go further and faster in accordance with the Union's own political ambition. I want to highlight that deeper and more integrated capital markets are a key factor for future investment needs.
That's why progress towards the Capital Markets Union is essential to mobilising the enormous investment required to tackle climate and environmental challenges, in addition to challenges related to the recovery. CMU has never been more needed than in this pandemic, which is a health crisis, but also an economic crisis with low growth and rising unemployment. Capital markets can help the economy adjust to sustainability challenges. Sustainable projects have to find market funding and so benefit from access to a deep and liquid market for green bonds with large active capital market players ready to step in. Moreover, capital markets can provide targeted funding for firms that aim to innovate or to grow sustainably, which will promote Europe's global competitiveness. The new CMU Action Plan is a broad combination of 16 measures to enable the development and integration of capital markets. So let me point to some of the most important ones. First, integrated capital markets can provide companies with more equity and equity-like funding, so there is a better overall funding mix. Given banks' declining capacity to provide credit and rising corporate debt levels, firms need to tap equity and other capital market instruments for their financing. More equity funding will also help better absorb the long-term damage of structural shocks, such as the pandemic. We'll also continue efforts to reduce the cost of access to capital markets for SMEs. Secondly, capital markets must provide citizens with more and better investment opportunities to benefit from the structural changes that our economy is undergoing. For instance, they should have access to better long-term returns on pension schemes or more resources for a more sustainable and circular economy. We want to make Europe a more transparent and cost-effective place for retail investors. That means reducing information overload, improving the quality of disclosure and increasing the quality of investment advice. Indeed, capital markets can boost sustainable investments and enable an environment in which large amounts of capital can be mobilised to achieve climate objectives. Last but not least, capital markets are a priority for the stability of our financial system during systemic shocks like this pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, recent news on vaccine trials suggests that there is light at the end of the tunnel. But as much as we hope never to experience an event like this again, we cannot afford to be caught unprepared. When addressing the major challenges that lie ahead, we're faced with some tough choices, especially about where we direct future financing and investment. I would like to be very clear that the COVID-19 crisis cannot be used as an excuse to delay addressing climate and environmental challenges. But we can map our way out of this crisis and into recovery. If we get this right, we'll embrace enormous transformational opportunities by making sure we channel investments into companies that can deliver on our green and sustainable objectives. Change is coming. We need to embrace the opportunities it will bring. Thank you. Many thanks to Commissioner McGuinness for her opening remarks there. There was a lot in there, I think, for us all to take away. She made the important commitment of the, the EU to take sustainable finance to the next level through the renewed sustainable finance strategy and also through the review of the non-financial reporting directive, which leads us nicely on to our next speaker, CDSB's technical director, Fiona Quinlan, the lead author of CDSB's research report on the state of environmental disclosure in the EU in 2020 to run us through the insights. Please do place any questions in the chat throughout both Fiona and the following speaker, Philip's presentations, and we'll do our best time pending to address those at the end. Fiona, over to you. Thank you, Marty, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, so as Marty said, I'm now going to present an overview of the key findings from our research this year, um, and I'll also touch on briefly some of our recommendations for companies and for policymakers as a result of this research as well. So just to provide an overview first on the background to this project. So this is CDSB's third annual review of reporting under the Non-Financial Reporting Directive. Um, so we've conducted uh, reviews since 2018, uh, really to look at the effectiveness of environment and climate reporting under the legislation and to really understand, is it driving that change that, that we were hearing in the commissioner's uh, video just now? Um, regarding providing investors with that information that they need to invest in uh, the European Green Deal and the low carbon transition. 
So on the one front, we do this to provide that feedback to policymakers on the implementation of the directive. Um, and also we really look to provide companies with that same feedback as well and to help identify good practices um, from within the review sample that we can share with companies um, to help them use that information to improve their reporting. And additionally, um, for those companies that we review within the, the sample of 50 companies, uh, we do offer direct feedback as well to help uh, on a one-to-one -one basis um, with improving their reporting. So one thing to note about this year's review uh, compared to our previous is that it's the first that we've conducted since the directive uh, released uh, its non-binding guidelines on climate information in 2019. So uh, we're interested as well to see really uh, how those directive guidelines, which uh, specifically address climate change um, and TCFD uh, requirements in the context of the non-financial directive um, can really help companies. And we wanted to see how that was working. So I'll now move to just presenting an overview of our kind of overall methodology. Thank you. So as the um, commissioner touched on, um, we've looked at 50 companies in this review um, and we've selected the, the 50 largest companies or 50 large companies in Europe. And really, I guess our emphasis in doing this was so that we uh, could really read them cover to cover, as Mardi said, um, but really to see how those companies who are perhaps best resource and we would hope to have the most mature reporting are able to address these recommendations. And I guess from that make some, some inferences about the wider picture. So we developed a content uh, set of questions based on the non-financial reporting directives requirements and the TCFD recommendations as well, and used this as the basis for reviewing company reports. And finally, um, our approach um, is to look at mainstream company reports in the first instance. So that would be their annual report or, or registration document. However, given the directive does allow companies to report the information elsewhere, um, we looked at other sources of information if this was the main location of the financial of the non-financial statement or if information was clearly linked or referenced from the mainstream report and was relevant to the questions that we wanted to answer. So moving on to a summary of what we've seen this year. So overall, we've seen some areas of improvement in disclosure relative to 2019, but we've also seen some where we haven't really seen any progress um, in the past year. So you see on the, the graph on the right hand side that summarizes some of the key content aspects that we considered in our review. Um, the gray bars show 2019 and the pink bars show 2020. So you see in particular that uh, TCFD uh, aligned disclosure is a, is a real area where we're still seeing progress um, and uptake um, to be quite low, particularly when it comes to scenario analysis and uh, risk disclosure. We also see that uh, environmental topics uh, beyond climate um, are still very much less commonly addressed within reporting. And this is something we looked at in a little bit more detail compared to our previous year, um, really seeing that issues around biodiversity and, and forestry perhaps are much less commonly reported. But overall, I guess, as we've said, um, although we see some improvements, really the, the completeness and overall coherence of information uh, is still falling short of what investors need to incorporate it effectively into their decision making. So I'll now give you an overview uh, through each of the different content aspects that we considered in the report, uh, just to touch on some of the, the insights we got in each area. So starting with business models. So we looked at uh, how well companies are disclosing environment and climate information on their business models. And we saw that overall, we're seeing a growing number, including information on climate and environment. However, quite often that information is still high level or quite limited in nature. We did see some growth in, in companies providing more clear and, and specific information. However, often statements were quite limited to generic statements of, of ambition around environment or climate without a lot of clarity on, on what that really meant for the business's strategy. Um, another thing we looked at was, was the location of this information. We do see that 78% of the um, companies are now integrating this information on environment and climate business models at the outset of their reports, um, which is encouraging in terms of the, the integration we're seeing there. So moving on to policies and due diligence. Generally, this is uh, one of the, the stronger areas of disclosure for companies where we do see uh, across the board that most of those 50 companies are able to provide uh, at least some information. And on policies, I think we would highlight here that those companies who set out clear policies that have uh, very clear commitments on environment and climate um, and have clear actions against them um, 
really are the ones who then use that structure to, to drive an overall good disclosure that's, that's well linked back to what they wanted to achieve there. In terms of due diligence, um, we see 70% of companies now providing uh, information on their board and management responsibilities for climate and environment. Um, however, we do see that uh, the remainder perhaps only provided one of those aspects or in some cases interpret uh, the disclosure requirements differently and provide perhaps more uh, operational or general information about their governance at a, at a lower level in the business. So not really addressing the leadership information that investors may want to see. And a final point um, to flag would be that uh, often, although we can infer that climate or environment is included within governance arrangements, uh, sometimes this isn't very explicit. So um, particularly when we consider uh, what the TCFD asks companies to uh, disclose about the, the specific ways that climate is included within governance, uh, often this, this level of specificity isn't evident. So turning now to the, the policy outcomes. Um, so this is uh, obviously reporting on the, on the progress against the policy commitments that we see. And here we assessed uh, what quantitative and qualitative information uh, companies are reporting. And we see that most are providing a balance of both information types, um, but really some of the challenges remain here regarding uh, the consistency of how that information is reported um, and how well it emphasizes and focuses on material aspects in particular. So as I've said, um, we see most companies or all companies reporting some information here um, and the majority, 86%, are able to clearly link uh, the outcomes that they report back to their policies. However, this does mean that we still have a, a minority 14% who perhaps uh, don't make that link and, and provide uh, general information on some outcomes that isn't really clearly linked to high level strategic goals. We see that uh, most uh, three quarters are now using indicators or performance targets in their reporting. Um, and where this is done, this is certainly helpful in terms of uh, providing uh, balance um, in terms of what progress has been made. We particularly highlight that where summary tables are used to, to group outcomes against different policy areas uh, can be very helpful as a means of providing a concise and clear summary of how companies have progressed against their policy commitments. Uh, sometimes information would instead be kind of uh, dispersed throughout the report in, in shorter updates, uh, which can make it hard to find a clear uh, overview of how policies are being achieved. And then another point um, that we'd highlight is even for companies that are, are providing quite good outcomes disclosure, often the balance of information in particular in addressing perhaps challenging areas of performance is lacking. So for example, um, a progress uh, against the target may indicate that it's off track, um, but often the accompanying narrative that would explain these challenges and, and provide information on how they're being addressed isn't provided. So that degree of transparency, I think, is, is often absent um, and clearly would be something uh, that stakeholders would find valuable to, to really understand overall progress. And finally, as I said, we really would highlight that this is a, an area in particular where we see a lot of uh, inconsistency, uh, both within different environmental topics included in reports by companies, but also across company reports. So uh, being able to, to see a clear comparison between companies and between topics is often still very much a challenge here. So turning now to principal risks, um, this is an area I think we've highlighted uh, on a number of occasions and, and would continue to do so as something that we really see uh, needs more progress. So um, particularly regarding uh, how specific companies are being about their risks and, and how much uh, they're able to quantify their impacts. So although we do see that the vast majority report some information on risks, um, we're still seeing that statements can be quite generic. Um, so uh, it might be a generic statement that climate impacts will affect the business, but it's not really clarified in any detail as to how those uh, business impacts will manifest or indeed the specific nature of climate risk for the business. However, one area that did progress this year, which was positive to see, is uh, we had 74% of the sample now considering at least some information on both of the two main risk types in the TCFD, uh, that's physical and transition risks, uh, showing some good progress since the prior year, which is positive. However, in terms of the, the remaining improvement areas, um, we still only have 4% who are able to provide clear information on how uh, climate risks will impact them over short, medium and long-term time horizons, uh, which is obviously quite low. 
Further, we see the ability of companies to provide clear information on how risks will impact them strategically and impact their business model, as it was also quite low. One final point I would highlight as a, as a kind of strength area that we'd encourage others to adopt is that some companies are now able to provide quite good linking in their report between uh, information on their non-financial statement with, with other aspects of their disclosure regarding risk. Um, so where this has been achieved, um, it's, it is helping to achieve greater coherence than perhaps we've seen in prior reports, um, but it's something not all companies are yet doing. So we'd encourage um, companies to look at the best practices in our report here perhaps to learn from those who are doing this well. So the final kind of area of the main content categories that we looked at before I touch on a, a few other points um, was key performance indicators. So here we see that uh, the kind of core environmental issues that companies perhaps are most familiar with, um, carbon emissions, energy and water, were disclosed um, at a high level by, by all of those top 50 companies. In particular, we saw um, some improvement in the uh, at least the frequency at which companies are reporting scope three. So we now see 74% providing some scope three disclosure. Um, so emissions relating to, to kind of value chain activities, uh, which is, is positive to see. However, the, there are still questions, I believe, around the, the kind of completeness um, and kind of comparability of that information, which I know I think Philip will touch on as well. Um, in terms of the, the kind of inclusion of information within executive remuneration, uh, we see about a quarter of companies now including KPIs in, in board level remuneration, so still uh, quite a low percentage here. And in terms of uh, other types of metric that perhaps may stray beyond the more familiar territory, um, so information that tries to link more clearly to, to finance, um, as is set out in the, in the directive's non-binding guidelines, is something that only a third are currently providing. And as we've already touched upon, uh, the different topic areas regarding environmental impacts and, and metrics on, on biodiversity or, or deforestation are still not very commonly seen. Next slide, please. So I'll just hurry along here because I'm conscious of uh, plenty of other things in our agenda. So just to summarize on, on the TCFD side, we've kind of touched on aspects of this from across the sample there. Um, and I think, you know, we see some improvement in, in areas, but, uh, but still ultimately those areas um, of most significance to TCFD regarding uh, information on risks and on the use of scenario analysis um, are really only adopted by a small number. So we had just 18% providing uh, full disclosure on uh, or clear disclosure on the use of scenario analysis. Although we did this year measure, um, I guess, more progress on the interim phases, and we did see that overall about 52% are providing some information on scenario analysis, so some progress, but more to do. Um, but it's interesting really to see that disparity still in the fact that we have 68% providing reference to TCFD, but far few, fewer who are able to provide the complete disclosure. So just the final kind of area of findings before I, I just touch on recommendations is the, the kind of materiality area and kind of where information is being reported. So we see that 82% of those large companies are putting this information into their mainstream annual report already, um, which is consistent with, with our prior experiences. We saw reports had grown in length compared to last year. So on average, we, we saw 19 pages in annual reports on environment and climate. Um, quite high really compared to um, last year. And in terms of the different materiality perspectives in reports, uh, we saw some growth in adoption of the, the double materiality perspective, which considers both impacts on the environment uh, by the business and the business's impact on the environment. Um, however, often information that is provided on materiality uh, can be somewhat vague. So this is an area where certainly more clarity would be beneficial. So I'll just move on very briefly to touch on some of the recommendations from our report. So for companies, um, we have a series of recommendations here. Um, I'll just touch on them briefly. So we have, um, I guess, really focused for companies in our report on providing recommendations about how to be uh, more specific in their reporting requirements. Um, so that covers a number of these policy points. So policies, you know, the more specific you can be, the more beneficial that is. Um, similarly, on the second point there, we see uh, that to be the case for risks. 
on performance indicators. Um, our recommendation here is really about ensuring that these are linked to material issues um, and are used effectively to track progress on policies so that that level of disclosure um, can be limited to material issues. And then the final few points really emphasize uh, ensuring use of the TCFD recommendations as a means of uh, hopefully streamlining disclosures by focusing on material matters um, for investors in the report um, and really ensuring that the mainstream report does include that information that investors consider to be financially material. So in terms of, I guess, how we can support companies with these recommendations, we just briefly wanted to highlight our Enhanced Reporting Europe campaign, um, which is a programme of support that we can offer to companies to support them in improving their disclosure um, with the support of, of the EU Life programme who funds this work. So um, you'll see there are a range of different activities we can support companies on. So um, we'd encourage you to get in contact with us if any of those would be of interest and we'd be more than happy to work with you um, to help as best we can. So just finally, uh, before we move on, I wanted to touch on our recommendations for policymakers as well. Um, so I think these mirror very closely those recommendations for companies, but, but try to get to the heart, I guess, of, of where we see challenges in the current directive that could be addressed to help support companies better in their disclosure. Firstly, um, we recommend removing the exemption at the moment that allows information to be provided outside of mainstream reports. Our review suggests that the majority of businesses are already providing mainstream disclosure um, and making this um, the case for all would provide better consistency in reporting. Secondly, um, we see that some areas of the directive, such as uh, perhaps policies and due diligence, um, are interpreted differently by different companies and not reported consistently. So we'd encourage um, the Commission to provide definitions for these terms within the directive itself. Thirdly, um, as we've already touched on, we believe that if the, the TCFD recommendations are embedded into the directive itself, rather than being placed in separate guidelines, um, that will better address um, the lack of uptake that we're currently seeing on the complete recommendations. The next recommendation we have um, is around emphasizing in the revision of the directive um, the overall coherence of this information for sustainable long-term value. So we've talked a lot about different content categories here, but often it's, it's still quite hard to get a connected view across this information of how companies are performing. Um, so this is something we'd really encourage um, is placed in greater emphasis in, in any further um, guidance or standards. And then finally, um, the last two points to cover there would be around uh, Whilst the, the revisions of the directive are ongoing, um, we're aware the, the European Commission is also very actively considering uh, you know, an initiative on corporate governance as well. So um, I think this really presents an opportunity to uh, connect these two pieces of legislation and ensure that uh, they can be used in a coherent manner by companies to provide information on environment and climate. And the final point um, we wanted to touch on here as well is, as we've seen, uh, issues beyond climate um, are not as commonly reported by companies at the moment, and indeed in not as much detail. So um, we'd encourage the Commission as well to consider uh, how this uh, greater adoption of these uh, topic areas can be considered in the revision as well, particularly given the EU Green uh, Deal sets out you know, actions in many of these areas that it will be important for companies to provide disclosure on. So with that, um, I'll just leave you with the, the names of the contacts in our team who work on this area. Um, I lead this from a technical point of view and in authoring our research, but um, work very closely with, with my two colleagues there on corporate and policy outreach too. So please do feel free to get in touch with us if you'd like to discuss this in further detail. So with that, I'll, I'll hand back over to Mardi for the rest of our agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona, for giving us the progress of the 50 largest companies and though I, I seem to think it's moving in the right direction, it still, it still appears to be falling short and is, I guess, consistent with what we are seeing globally from all the reports you have to read from the rest of the world. But, but I, I draw thinking back to what Commissioner McGuinness said uh, earlier on, there seems to be a real still sort of a failure to link the narrative disclosure with financial impacts and the numbers in the back of the report. And, and Anyway, from, from what you've seen and all the reports I've read with you, we really still aren't seeing the, the what putting the financial and the non-financial on the same footing um, and truly integrating sustainability at every step of the value chain. So let's hope next time we, uh, we undertake this study that we have seen even more progress and alignment in that direction. In my introductory remarks today, I mentioned that collaboration is in CDSB's DNA and we always welcome the opportunity to work with our good friends 
uh, at the Alliance of Corporate Transparency, which we are members of to further our mission. So I'm delighted today to welcome Philip Greger, the Head of Responsible Companies section at Frank Bold to present their recent and complementary findings on climate and environmental disclosure in Southern and Eastern Europe. Philip, the stage is yours. Thank you, Mardi, and congratulations on the re release of your research, and thank you for having me. Uh, so I, I speak on behalf of Frank Bold, but we are coordinating the Alliance for Corporate Transparency. If you can move to the next slide, I can, I can explain what the Alliance is. It's essentially an initiative, a research project, which is supported by a number of civil society initiatives in this, uh, in this field, which logo you can, logos you can see on the, uh, on the screen. And essentially all these organizations contributed to a discussion on, on what, uh, what, the, what the ideal content of companies reporting should, uh, should look like. So if you move to the next, uh, next screen, I can, uh, I, can, I can use it to illustrate that we've been doing this for uh, two or three years as well. Last year, we analyzed 1,000 European companies. This year, we focused on 300 companies from south and eastern part of, uh, of, the, of the EU. And both our findings, focus, and uh, methodology has been highly aligned with the, with the CDSB analysis of the top 50 European companies. So on the next slide, I can, uh, I can demonstrate these differences and complementarities. As you can see, we focus on a larger number of companies, but specifically on high risk sectors and regions from the, from the perspective of uh, economic transition to uh, carbon uh, neutrality. So we focus very much on the Spain and Italy and Poland, and we've included a number of other companies from other Eastern EU countries. But since the capital markets are not so developed there, those numbers are slightly, slightly lower. Uh, the most represented sector was financial sector, that means bank, banks and insurance undertakings, and those investors who are themselves listed on stock exchanges, as well as energy and resource extraction companies, as you can see. So without the further ado, please, uh, let's move to the next slide. So now I'll briefly, very briefly, present some of our findings and explain how they, you know, uh, how they support uh, the CDSB's uh, analysis. So first of all, uh, we looked at uh, how companies are providing KPIs, non-financial KPIs. And we found that only one out of four companies are presenting them in a form of a summarized statement, which is a significant problem because if 75% of companies are not providing these KPIs or rather mostly providing them scattered all over the report, it kind of undermines the purpose of the <laughs> and usability of the, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the report. So um, I should also say that we found that 42% of the companies included in our, in our sample included the, uh, the, uh, the findings, oh, sorry, the you know, financial statement inside of the main annual management report. This is significantly lower than the 82% uh, recorded by the CDSB research. And it's because we've analyzed you know, uh, a lot of smaller companies. Uh, interestingly, the lowest result in this regard was recorded, recorded in Italy, Mary, 21% of companies integrated the, uh, their no financial statements in the main report. And in Poland, it was 36%. In other countries, it was mostly between 40 and 50%. So let's move on to the next slide, please. We've asked a couple of questions concerning uh, governance and business models. And here again, uh, there are just some, some highlights in this regard. One interesting finding is that only 10% of companies provide some information on the sustainability matters that have been addressed by the board. This is in contrast to the, uh, to the reporting on formal sustainability governance arrangements or board mandate. So in that regard, the, uh, the uh, CDSB's uh, research found that uh, I think almost 80% of companies are actually providing, uh, or 70% of companies are disclosing their board mandate to address climate issues or oversee uh, climate policies. Our research found similar, similar, similar uh, for the similar question that 35% of companies do so. But if you look at the implementation, the information on the implementation of that, of that board mandate, these numbers drop significantly. And similarly, uh, while 40% of companies mention risks to their business model related to climate change, which correlates with the CDSB analysis of the top 50 companies, which found this in 52% of cases, uh, only half of these half of these companies are specifying effects of such risks 
on, uh, on, uh, on the business model, which is one of the TCFD's uh, criteria. So in our research, it was 22%. In the CDSB analysis of top 50 companies, it was 32%. So one, one can see you know, certain uh, issues when it comes to the application of the TCFD criteria. On the next slide, uh, uh, we have summarized the main, the main findings of our research. We have differentiated, we have differentiated between, uh, between disclosure of uh, policies that specify key issues and objectives of the company and uh, disclosure of specific risks and disclosure of outcomes uh, measured against the, the, the concrete targets of the policy. There's the dark blue, uh, there's the, those are the dark blue numbers and percent. Uh, and those disclosures of policies, outcomes, and risks that were nominal and didn't really provide it insight into, into what company is doing, what it is exposed to, and so on and so forth. There's the light blue. The red, well, that stands for no disclosure, essentially. And again, these numbers are lower than in the CDSB's uh, research, which is because, we, because of the uh, different sample of, uh, of, uh, of companies. But essentially, there is a, there is a high level of, uh, of uh, correlation. You can see that on the policy, a vast majority of companies are providing some disclosures, 77% uh, if, you, if you count in dark blue and blue and light blue, and that's, that's quite, quite similar to the CDSB's findings. But on the outcomes, there is a significant difference, suggesting that those top 50 companies analyzed by the CDSB are relatively major in terms of reporting basic information on the outcomes. But when it comes to smaller companies, even from high risk sectors, uh, this number drops to well, 25% according to our research. So, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, let's say, an interesting point of comparison. As regards the risks, our sample, again, uh, not uh, surprisingly, shows that uh, only, let's say, lesser number of companies providing disclosure of risks. So 58% if you count in both blue segments compared to 86% in the CDSB research. But when looking deeper at the quality of these disclosures, especially applying the TCFD criteria, the numbers start to align, which is uh, you know, a very interesting finding given the differences in samples. So we'll get to it in a, in a, in a moment. On the next slide though, uh, there is a summary of a more you know, specific questions concerning the content of companies' policy disclosures. And one line in particular, the, the one before last, uh, which reads companies' climate target is science-based or aligned with the goals of the Paris Agreement is particularly telling because it, it shows uh, to what extent are companies at least claiming that their policies are aligned with the, with the EU decarbonization uh, objectives. And, and you can see that the results of, in Spain are much higher than elsewhere in Europe. And, it's, uh, and there has been a recorded increase from the last year. So there, there is, and this is probably attributable due to the to the legislative changes in, uh, in Spain. Yet we should not forget that that's still below 50% and we've analyzed high risk sectors such as energy. So there is a still a big gap to be, uh, to, be, uh, to be closed. On the next slide, there is a summary of the, of the uh, TCFD inspired criteria for the content of risks reporting. And again, we can see that these smaller companies from let's say, uh, if I may say so, hopefully not offending anyone, very far regions of the, of the EU show worse results and, uh, and uh, less, let's say, major information than those top 50 companies analyzed by the CDSB. And one can see this, especially on the, on the numbers for the physical and transition uh, risks disclosures where, uh, where our results peak at around 50 or 40 percent, depending on the country and the, the category of, uh, of risks compared to more than 75% according to the, uh, among the top 50 companies. But then if you look at those really important criteria, which is the first one, that is whether the risk and opportunities are provided for short, mid, as well as long term, term time horizons. And one before the last, which uh, asks whether uh, the risk assessment is based or includes climate related scenarios, including a well below two degrees Celsius the numbers are actually aligned, which is quite surprising and, and showing that there is actually not much maturity in reporting both on the, by the, uh, let's say top 50 European companies as documented by the CDSB, as well as more broadly uh, uh, in the high risk and sectors and countries. So our numbers are slightly higher for the 
uh, risks and time horizons, which is due to the inclusion of the high risk or focus on the high risk sectors, uh, but they are almost almost the same as, uh, as um, in case of the CDSB's finding, findings. So let's move to the next slide, please. These slides illustrate the differences between, between among the countries we have uh, analyzed. And as you can see, when it comes to the policies, again, just uh, supporting the <laughs> CDSB's finding, the situation is not so bad. But when we, uh, and, but uh, the situation is not, you know, let's say tragic <laughs> when it comes to the disclosure of risks. But when we look at the criteria, which are indicative of companies, let's say strategic work, or integration of risks in their, in their strategies, such as information on the quality of the targets and, and the time horizons, the map is simply turning, uh, turning red. And even in a, in a in country such as Spain, which have you know, advanced so much in terms of uh, climate, uh, climate change targets reporting, we are not getting into, into, into green numbers. So please, let's, uh, let's move to the next slide. Uh, and this is this is uh, this is my last slide. So there are there are a couple of uh, let's say findings or conclusions that can be derived from from our research, and that is that there doesn't seem to be a consistent application a consistent application of criteria for either side of double materiality. We haven't looked at the question of materiality in through the same lenses as the CDSB uh, did in their research, but at the same time we found it uh, we found it almost impossible sometimes to determine whether the company, you know, what kind of criteria the company is, uh, is, uh, is applying. It was quite clear whether the company is using a double materiality perspective or a financial materiality perspective. But when it came to the uh, kind of you know, explaining the reasons why a particular issue is actually considered either financially or socially uh, relevant, those, the, 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 this information is typically not included in the, in the, in the reports. Then there are methodological issues when it comes to application of some of the, let's say, more advanced yet essential KPIs, especially on the scope three, uh, GHG emissions, GHG intensity, and most importantly, risk exposure KPIs in the financial sector. So, so we, we've taken a look at the EC guidelines on climate related reporting, which include a, a number of suggestions for banks and insurers in terms of what kind of KPIs they should report and essentially only a handful of companies in the surveyed countries uh, do use them. So we are, we are below 5% really. And finally, uh, when companies provide information on natural resources and biodiversity, it is often not contextualized. We get a lot of reporting on use of water, but very little reporting on, on the context in terms of risks to water stress. So really undermines the materiality of such disclosure. So uh, there was a very, very brief <laughs> overview. And the, the bottom line here is that the, the results for the top 50 companies uh, that uh, CDSB, uh, the CDSB ha have analyzed are highly correlate with other findings of, uh, of the analysis of 300 high risk companies from those, let's say, high risk uh, regions. Even though we are focused on, let's say, small companies or smaller companies compared to those top 50 business enterprises. So thank you very much. Thanks, Philip. And, uh... I, I must say, you, you mentioned about the contextualization uh, just then at the end. It's something we've seen for quite some time. And due to the generous EU life funding that we have to do this research, we're producing guidance across next year on uh, reporting environment and biodiversity in mainstream reports, which should help add to that, as well as some detailed water guidance, which is actually out at the moment for consultation. So please do look at that on our website. And please continue to pop questions in the chat. Philip will address those uh, and Fiona as we move through to our final uh, speaker. So to finish our morning with some food for thought and perspectives on future developments in the corporate reporting space, I'm very happy to turn to Patrick de Camborg for, the, for our closing keynote, who needs no introduction, but I will still remind everyone of his various hats. Since March 2015, Patrick, a chartered accountant and auditor, has been the president of the Auditore des Normes Compatibles, I, uh, although my name is Mardi, I cannot speak French, uh, the French Accounting Standards Center. Since the beginning of September 2020, Patrick chairs the project task force on the pre preparatory work of the elaboration of possible EU non-financial reporting standards established by the Europe Financial Reporting Advisory Group, EFRAG, following the mandate of Dombrovskis, Dombrovskis gave the EFRAG group. 
the, um, the, the preparatory group has been working at a fast pace and has already published an interim report last month. And as we heard earlier from Commissioner McGuinness, we look forward to the final one in January or the next report in January next year. Patrick has been leading the reflections in this space since the publication of his report for the French government in May 2019, where he made proposals to improve non-financial information's relevance and reliability, looking at the goal methodology, a targeted system in four pillars, and the operational organization one should follow in order to foster harmonization and standardization of non-financial reporting. Patrick, over to you. Patrick, I think you're on mute. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mardi. And um, and and thank you to thank you to CDSB for its invitation. It's an honor and pleasure to contribute to this event. Uh, of course, uh, I'm not expressing any views of the task force in this uh, in this event. Uh, we will wait until the final report is issued. Um, a brief word on the context, uh, as you mentioned, and as Commissioner McGuinness mentioned. Uh, EFRAG Corporate Reporting Lab received a mandate to work on uh, preparatory work related to EU standard setting. And that's what we are doing. So the uh, task force following this mandate has been established uh, during the summer uh, with 35 members uh, from uh, all horizons and a, a variety of geographies in the Union plus nine uh, persons representing major EU public authorities. Uh, so we are operating uh, on a video conference basis uh, with more, more than 50 people for plenary meetings. Uh, we kicked off uh, on September 11, and we have a very short time frame because we are due to um, to deliver our final report by the end of January. And that's absolutely consistent with the objective of the commission to deliver a, a revised, uh, a draft, a revised uh, NFRD uh, for the end of the first quarter, as Commissioner McGuinness uh, said. We divided the work in three phases. Phase one is uh, what well, it was dedicated to uh, what we called assessment phase two and we are right in the middle of phase two is dedicated to proposals and January will be dedicated to uh, to uh, of course the final report and outreaches outreach activities uh, we 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 were we were uh, considering having a consultation but due to the time constraints a written consultation, I think it's a bridge too far and we, we uh, are encouraging uh, speed rather uh, and, and, and hope that the outreach activities will, will help us uh, communicate with the communities. We have six uh, outreach uh, uh, meetings uh, scheduled. So a few words about the progress report. Uh, it was issued early in November, so uh, let me mention that on certain key topics we are continuing the assessment because it was there was a huge amount of data which we had to uh, to uh, consider. And I have six key, you know, the six key points that we we can uh, communicate uh, are the following ones. The first one is that there is a EU momentum. Uh, and this EU momentum is in the space of sustainable finance and sustainable growth, as mentioned by Commissioner McGuinness. But also, there are other initiatives, like uh, the one that has been mentioned this morning uh, on uh, sustainable, sustainable corporate governance. And all this uh, is uh, in the context of a focus on sustainable reporting, general purpose, uh, general purpose sustainable reporting for investors and also for other stakeholders. So what is what, what appears to be obvious is that there is a call for moving from what I would call NFRD1 to NFRD2, or maybe I should say sustainable reporting a directive. 
if uh, because non-financial is a tricky word we define something by, by, by what it's not so it's not necessarily a good idea so this uh, this momentum creates a very specific environment also uh, you know a a a key uh, impetus uh, uh, towards change and therefore the the need to have at one the same time a legislative proposal and also a standard, a standard setting level point number two uh, finding number two is that we have identified as it was requested by uh, executive vice president dombrovskis in his mandate uh, the possible input from initiatives or references or standards that are available uh, in many jurisdictions and many and, and also at global level so uh, we have we are currently assessing about 100 initiatives so it's huge with uh, and we have identified leaving aside the sector specific uh, uh, indicators we have identified probably about uh, four to five thousand kpis so uh, there is a host of kpis and the obvious uh, the obvious conclusion and that there is an if you want to have preparers in a position to work in a way that is efficient and that we and if you want to improve comparability you need to simplify uh, while at the same time promoting relevance and do that via public legitimacy. So that's in fact the key point. Uh, in order to move to the next step in, uh, in uh, sustainability reporting, the public legitimacy should also give a clear framework in terms of what are of the, in, of the information, uh, the data points that are needed. Third finding is that uh, in fact, there are key differences in the conceptual, the, in the underlying conceptual frameworks. And uh, if you want to create a clear environment for standard setting, you need at legislative level, but also at standard setting level via guidelines to establish uh, what are the uh, uh, EU underlying basis for sustainability reporting and therefore for sustainability uh, standard setting. So uh, questions such as how to uh, embody uh, uh, double materiality is a, key, is a key issue. Because it's true that beyond the religious debate about single or double materiality, there is a need to operationalize the concept. But there are other concepts as well that are key. And please refer to the detailed report. Fourth finding is a, a crucial need to interconnect financial and sustainability reportings. Because uh, at the moment, there is, uh, I mean, each, each, each of the two legs is following its own way. So uh, in order to walk straight, you need to have well-coordinated legs. If the legs are not coordinated well, you probably stumble somehow. So, uh, and, uh, and this situation is coming from the fact that financial information is pretty mature with, with very clear concepts, uh, while uh, uh, sustainability information is still, uh, you know, at an early stage and not mature enough. And therefore, the, the, there is a need to enhance uh, uh, non-financial information in order to put that second leg on an equal footing uh, with, 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 with financial information. And this is not only a, a question of principle or a question of governance, it is a question of technical uh, continuity between one information and the other information. And there are migrations between the two and there are linkages which are necessary. The fourth, the fourth, the fifth finding finding is obviously that the financial institutions are confronted uh, with uh, specific challenges because they are at one the same time preparers but also users of financial information, and when you create obligations for them to report on 
something where they need data from uh, from ec economic players, uh, it becomes a challenge because at the moment, and therefore the the battle to 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 the, the winning the battle for reliable, comparable, and relevant uh, data is key for financial institutions because they cannot rely today, as you have clearly uh, highlighted, uh, on on a a a, a an environment that is offering the quality of data that is needed. Sixth and last point, it is, uh, uh, you know, we observed that, and we are observing that there is a fragmentation in terms of reporting location and formats. And that is not creating an easy, uh, easy access to information. And, as a consequence, uh, digitization remains embryonic. And, and therefore, you know, machine readable information, which is a, a key element of any future landscape, is uh, in itself, uh, you know, at a very, very, very early stage. And that would be uh, uh, so. I am putting the emphasis on the assessment points. I'm not putting the emphasis on the recommendations that will be derived from those assessment points. But you know, a good assessment is a, is a foundation for good recommendations. So I hope that what we are doing today will be, uh, uh, will be uh, you know, clear enough uh, by the end of January in order to establish at standard setting level, i.e. what we call in the EU level two, to know you a right roadmap, a, a good, architecture and you know a phasing towards real progress in the EU which I think is key together with you know a monitoring and contribution to a global initiatives which are of course uh, uh, int of interest so it's a it's a we I think the intent is to create some sort of win-win situation to foster progress thank you Thank you, Patrick, and we look forward very much to seeing the, the report in uh, the end of January and also working with you to get one. A win-win situation is, is absolutely what we want to see. So thank you to all of you for joining us and to our great speakers. This has really been a very interesting morning for me, um, as well as I'm sure it has been for you. 2021 will definitely be an important year for sustainable finance and corporate reporting. And I expect to see even more activity than we have in 2020, if that, even if that's possible to imagine. We've heard from Commissioner McGuinness today some very important messages showing how the EU leadership and commitment when it comes to making sustainability a top priority with relevant links to climate policies, a green recovery, and, and the important need to strengthen the role of the capital markets. What I share from her remarks is that sustainability is definitely not a luxury and that action from all parties needs to happen despite um, not because of COVID-19 crisis, to move the trillions that we need to move and to change the behaviours in the longer term. We also heard from Patrick just now about the crucial reflections the EU has started on, the need to harmonise corporate reporting frameworks and, and an interesting, um, the four chair analogy, which I really enjoy. We hope you feel energised and full of hope like I do, despite some of the challenges ahead of us. CDSB will keep providing expertise to regulators and supervisors, as well as companies to help navigate their corporate reporting journey, as uh, Fiona outlined earlier. Please do get in touch. It's free. We can come and help you and, and have a good look at your corporate reporting with you. So yeah, do reach out. And there are lots more interesting resources and conversations happening at the moment, not least the EU's Business and Biodiversity Platform, which is a two day event this week on the green recovery, shaping business for nature and people. And we highly recommend you join that. And Lars has popped a link in the chat for that. So please do, as I said, reach out at any stage if we can be of assistance. Thank you for your time today and have a lovely afternoon. Goodbye.